from Number 5 Chambers, this is The Planning Podcast and I'm Richard Kimblin. Today we turn to carbon. We're turning to carbon in the context, firstly, of a Scottish case called Vorlich. You might think you don't need to know about a Scottish case concerned with the extraction of oil and EIA, where one is seeking to exploit a fossil fuel. But the case has a lot to say about where particular failings in respect of EIA procedures either play out positively or negatively in a challenge to a development consent. But it also has a lot to say about how in undertaking that environmental assessment one is to take account of the carbon impacts. It's the scope three question whether or not the carbon impact of using the product is to be taken into account. So it's about the process of EIA as well. And we're very fortunate to have Howard Leithhead, Planning and Environmental Barrister at Number 5 Chambers, to join us and explain the case and its consequences, and then to be joined by Harj Narella. He is a pupil in the Planning and Environment Group at Number 5 Chambers, but also holds a position at Oxford University, where he is actively researching climate change litigation. And we have the benefits of his insights into strategic litigation. Will there be more of it? What's it aiming at? And what's its impact going to be? Let's see what Howard has to say first. Hello and good evening to you, Howard. Good evening, Richard. Now, you've been to Scotland. Well, figuratively. Figuratively, you've been to Scotland. And what did you come back with? I came back with a very interesting judgment from the Court of Session. Well, there we go. Some people come back with whiskey, but here we go. We've got the Court of Session in a house. Why on earth would we be interested in that case? It's a really interesting case on EIA development, Richard. I think there are two key points which make this case interesting. The first is that it shows that the procedures for advertising EIA development are important. And secondly, it deals with the knotty issue of whether to assess the carbon impacts of the products of a scheme when assessing the environmental impacts. So this is, this is the Vorlich case. We're way out in the North Sea. And as I understand it, you are obliged to undertake an EIA if you want to exploit hydrocarbons in the North Sea. And that's what happened. But this is a complaint by Greenpeace about two things. One is procedural and the other is the way in which the carbon impacts were assessed. Yes. Lots in it. So with the, with the procedural points that were taken here, from the point of view of the planner who's occupied with major residential development, should they be at all interested in what happened to a set of procedural complaints in respect of EIA of an oil field? To some extent, they should be interested. Yes, I I think so, because the procedural points can't be ignored. Um, However, uh, what was significant about this case is that while there were minor breaches, Lord Carloway, the judge, said that the requirements were substantially met. And he described the grounds so far as they're based on procedural defects as being overwhelmingly technical and unconvincing. So whilst you can't ignore the procedural points, I think this judgment shows that you don't quite get everything absolutely right. That's not necessarily fatal. It struck me that this was of some assistance to those who might be defending the challenge brought on EIA grounds, where there were complaints about advertising and the nature of the consultation. Yeah. And where you get to the point that there's been some problem with that advertising, but there's been substantial compliance. The comfort that those defending might take from that is that if there's substantial compliance, the court is going to be less than interested. That's absolutely right, yeah. So then there's the carbon question, which was to do with environmental assessment for the purposes of understanding what the carbon impacts might be. What was the issue that was decided there and practically why does it matter? The key point is that when you're focusing on the effects of the development, you're you're looking at the effects of the development, not the effects of the consumption of the product down the line. 
So in the Vorlich uh, case, Lord Carlaway agreed with Mr Justice Holgate in Finch and Surrey County Council, who said that the fact that the environmental effects of consuming an end product will flow inevitably from the use of a raw material in making that product doesn't provide a legal test for deciding whether they can properly be treated as effects, quote, of the development. Now, of course, in an environmental statement, you need to consider indirect as well as direct effects of the development. But what Mr Justice Holgate said in Finch is that while indirect effects cover consequences which are less immediate, they must nevertheless be effects which uh, the development itself has on the environment. And in Voilich, Lord Carloway, uh, who followed uh, Mr Justice Holgate, said that it would not be practicable in an assessment of the environmental effects of a project for the extraction of fossil fuels for the decision maker to conduct a wide ranging examination into the effects, local or global, of the use of that fuel by the final consumer. So both Finch and Vorlich are about oil, but this can apply to anything, car batteries, absolutely anything. The key point is to look at the effects, direct and direct, of the development itself. Now, of course, Finch is going to the Court of Appeal, so it's possible that the situation may change in the near future, but obviously that's not going to affect the judgment in Vorlich. Okay, so you mentioned car batteries. Let's pick that up. Suppose you have a factory, the purpose of which is to make batteries for cars, following on the government's announcements and the way in which it's promoting uh, that transition. EIA required for the enormous factory which is required for that purpose. As a matter of law, does one take account of the carbon impact, beneficial or adverse, of people running around in electric cars? No. We don't do that. No, because because that's too far down the line. I mean, as Lord Colloway said, it's, it's too complicated, but it's also as a, you know, it's, it's a straightforward matter of law. It, it's not the effects of the development. It's, it's, it's the effects of the consumer down the line, or the consumption down the line, I should say. So from Greenpeace's point of view, Greenpeace was saying, well, the whole purpose of the development is to win the oil from the strata beneath the North Sea and for it to be burnt one way or another. Yeah. They say that as a matter of law, it's necessary to take account of that impact. But Court of Session says, no, that's too complicated. Yeah, and, and, and the High Court, of course, made a similar point in Finch. Finch is going to the Court of Appeal, is it? Very soon, yes. Right, so maybe we should come back to it, see if, it, see if it's the same answer. I, I, th I think we should. There'll be an important judgment in the next few weeks to months. OK, well, let's come back to that one now. OK. Hello and good afternoon to you, Harj. Hi, Richard, how are you? I'm really good, I'm really good. It's very good of you to find the time to do this because I know that you're frantically busy, A, sorting out everything that pupillage throws at you, B, getting ready to go to Glasgow. I gather there's something going on up there. Uh, and C, in, in addition to all of those things, you've got an academic aspect to your activities, haven't you? You're, I do. You're a climate academic as well. Yeah, so I, I've got a, um, a post at Oxford with the Sustainable Law Programme there, um, which Tom Betzer heads up, and I uh, look at climate issues there, climate law issues. So, yeah, I like to, I like to mix it up, kind of dabble in a few different areas. But, um, yeah, excited to get up to COP later this week and see the action. Exactly. Well, I had a, a really helpful discussion with uh, Howard Leithhead about the Vorlich case, which uh, he's done a great note on, setting out right. exactly what that decided in a very a sort of straight bat sort of way. Uh, of course, in current context, uh, many people will have views about uh, the activity of exploring for and uh, exploiting uh, fossil fuels, but the yeah. the legal issues uh, in that case are themselves really very interesting and very important in a wide variety of uh, spheres. And it's, it's one of those cases which I think you would say falls into uh, a category which people have started to call strategic litigation or climate litigation. Yeah. And it's, it seems to be one particular species of, of climate litigation. It's obviously a public law claim, a challenge to a decision to give consent for a project. We see all sorts of claims of that sort. Um, the large majority, nothing to do with climate. But do you think, do you think, Harge, that climate is 
an increasing focus of challenges to to these sorts of decisions? Yeah, I, I definitely. I think you know domestically in in the UK, we've seen a lot of those cases recently. This year, the West Cumbria mine, you know, that that's has been subject to a number of challenges from both sides actually of that of that dispute. Firstly, a, a judicial review of the the project brought by community groups and then by the actual proponent of the of the mine. Klein Earth was was running a number of cases against the, the Drax gas plant in North Yorkshire. So um, I think you've you've definitely seen you know the use of uh, sort of permitting cases, public law challenges as a way to to raise climate issues in a strategic way in the UK and and also internationally as well. And that's part of the broader movement of, of climate litigation that's really picked up over the last kind of five years, I would say. Okay, so a gradual increase over a, over a period of years and a number of notable ones this year that you've you've just highlighted. In, in Vorlich and indeed in the, the Whitehaven cases that you've referred to, that the defendants, the government, essentially the decision maker, what, what would you say in, in that sort of type of case? Are those strategic cases brought against governments other than in respect of particular projects or plans? Are there other types of cases that, that we've seen? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think climate litigation can definitely be broken down into a few different categories, and, and this is one of them. So obviously we've already spoken about trying to oppose specific projects um, and using a range of different causes of actions to, to achieve that goal. But obviously government governments can be the target of more systemically oriented litigation. So this is generally kind of modeling off the agenda case, which really set the standard in terms of these sorts of challenges. And that was one which obviously sued the Dutch government in 2013 for, for failing to have sufficiently ambitious um, emissions reductions. And that set off a, a, a essentially a cascade of a number of, a number of similar cases. So the, the Irish case was one that was handed down um, last year, in July of last year, which the court essentially quashed the government's decision to approve the national mitigation plan as being inconsistent with the Irish constitution and the uh, European Convention on Human Rights. And that was following the similar type of um, the blueprint essentially set by agenda. And we've seen similar cases in South Korea, in Germany, in Italy, and so on. So I think that that is a category that stands apart from the permitting um, and project oriented challenges. So mainly kind of looking at the uh, national policy level ambition of, of governments. But I think there are other examples too. So one that I, I think is particularly interesting at the moment is the O'Donnell and Commonwealth case in, in Australia. So this is a, a challenge to Australia's sovereign bonds um, market, essentially suing the Australian government, an individual suing the Australian government failing to take account of climate risk and disclosing that information uh, as to climate risk to to investors in Australian uh, sovereign bonds. That's a very interesting approach where you have um, government being again, sued on, on climate grounds, but it's quite different, I would say, to those agenda style cases or uh, cases that are, are seeking to oppose a particular project. So if I'm, if I'm getting this right, sort of category one, we've been talking about the Volick type cases. Yes. It's directed primarily towards a particular project and a particular decision. We're used to that. Yeah. Agenda, the, the German case, the Irish case, a wide variety of litigation in jurisdictions outside of the UK, those cases are aiming at a much bigger target. They're aimed at the government's policy and saying to the government, your policy in respect of climate change is uh, not adequate. It's not legally adequate. Change it. But you've just taken us to a, a new sphere, which is it's not really to do with the overarching climate policy. It's to, it's to do with the application of of those policies in a particular financial sphere. That, that's what I'm getting out of. Yeah. Of what you've just said. Yeah, you're spot on, Richard. So I think it, it's worth unpacking this this particular case. So this was brought by. Um, equity generation lawyers who were the, the lawyers who were behind the McVeigh and Rest case. And so that was a case which was brought again by an individual against their pension fund 
for saying their pension fund did not take account of climate risks and disclose that to um, members of the pension fund. And so the O'Donnell case is essentially taking exactly the same logic that was used in the McVeigh case, but then applying it to the Australian government, saying that they have obligations to investors in their sovereign bonds to disclose the risks that Australia is exposed to, the climate transition risks, physical risks, as something that is relevant. And uh, in failing to do that, they're actually misleading investors. So that's the nature of the claim. And I think this represents a shift into a different terrain for climate litigation focused on corporations, focused on trying to shift the behaviour of market actors and essentially try and change the, the, the flow of capital um, so it's consistent with, with climate aims. So it's a really interesting development. It is. It is. And, and it shows the variety of contexts in which the same issues might arise. And so what one immediately understands that when you're talking about climate litigation, it can really take you almost anywhere. Uh, it's really fascinating. But presumably the motivations are perhaps somewhat similar. I don't know. Look, you, you tell me, because I can imagine that there are lots of potential motivations for bringing such cases. But from, from your perspective, what, what seem to be the key drivers behind those sorts of challenges? I think it really depends on the, on the plaintiff. Right? And so I think it's worth thinking about who are the different types of plaintiffs in climate litigation cases internationally. Um, I've already mentioned McVeigh, that's an example of an, of an individual bringing a case. A lot of these are, are driven by community groups and NGOs. Often community groups will be resisting a particular project in their, in their neighbourhood and their environment. And I think we're familiar with those sorts of challenges. But then you have kind of more emergent or, or more recently established civil society groups that are have been created specifically to push climate issues. And I think Fridays for Future, the, the youth climate movement is a great example of that. And they've been involved in, in a number of cases, some that we've already mentioned today. So for example, the, the South Korean climate case was, was launched by 19 youth claimants. The Sharma case in, in Australia was, was launched by um, eight children and, and a nun. So you have interesting constellations of of plaintiffs, but it's not just community groups or individuals. You also have governments. So you have you know city level governments taking legal action. A famous case at the moment is um, New York City is suing Exxon Mobil for breaching its consumer protection law, and essentially alleging there's misleading conduct there, uh, and also for for, for greenwashing um, claims as, as part of that case. So you have a range of different plaintiffs who then obviously have a range of different motivations and I think it's um, something that you can only really, really evaluate based on the particular case but in terms of other drivers of these sorts of cases I think aside from the discrete interests of those plaintiff groups I think one of the kind of basic reasons is that this is it's an effective strategy you know these are climate community groups that are motivated by seeking to address the climate crisis a lot of them are in countries where the political process has, to their eyes at least, failed in delivering on that. And the courts offer, I think objectively, a effective mechanism for, for driving climate action. So you know, that, that would be viewed by some people potentially as a misuse of the courts, but it's definitely a strategy that, that's been adopted nonetheless. So I think there are a, a range of different motivations um, behind this sort of action. So when I when I think about motivation, I also think about what a party to litigation wants out of it. And generally speaking, uh, a party will want to win. That's kind of the that's kind of the big deal. That's why yeah. you're there. Uh, and of course, in, in the Vorlick case, Greenpeace lost. But I, I wonder about that. In, in climate litigation, does it really matter if you lose? Do, are there are there collateral features of the litigation which which make it worthwhile pushing the point or the points in any event is it more than just win or lose are there wider impacts yeah i, I think you're spot on i think that's the nature of strategic litigation like this it, it goes beyond the discrete remedy that's that's sought i think there are kind of two two views essentially that can be formed around what are the implications of failed cases or bad cases, cases that are not argued particularly well. I think the glass half empty 
approach to that is that that can set bad precedents. It can undermine subsequent cases which might have been successful had they had the opportunity to, to, to run um, without that precedent in place. And that can ultimately damage the, the cause. But I think, you know, in, in thinking about that, you need to step back and consider the nature of, of these plaintiffs. Again, there's scarce funding for a lot of these cases. It's public interest lawyers doing this, um, barristers on a pro bono or low fee basis. They don't have large legal teams. And so they can't um, reach the standard that they would reach if they had big teams of lawyers. And particularly for climate cases, this matters quite a lot because of the nature of expert evidence, very technical as an area to put in a little plug. Oxford has published some great research recently looking at the role of attribution science in climate litigation and basically saying that many of the cases that use attribution science would have been more successful had they just used better evidence, better scientists. It may be that there's just the odd one or two of people listening in who are just going, attribution science, uh, I'll make yes. a note of that. <laughs> Go on, help us. So attribution science is essentially the, the science of attributing climate events to causes, so discrete sort of uh, polluting activities. So linking, for example, the emissions of a particular coal mine with um, a typhoon or a wildfire. And so the, the act of trying to engage in attribution science is connecting these events. And that is obviously a crucial dimension of establishing causation, which is key to establishing uh, liability. So attribution science is kind of seen by many as the sort of silver bullet from an evidentiary perspective for, for climate litigation. But there are a range of different scientific questions in, in general that are relevant to the different climate cases. Yeah, and, and hugely complex as, as any attempt to assess many environmental compartments that you've come across in routine practice. It's full of uncertainty and getting to a point where you're able to persuade a tribunal, whatever sort, that you've passed a particular threshold in terms of the standard of proof is it's a big deal isn't it exactly it is and and it, it's a big challenge to, to under-resourced um claimants that are, that are bringing these cases yeah i mentioned that in the context of thinking about their kind of different ways of understanding strategic litigation there's you know litigation that fails there's the glass half empty approach i think the glass half full read is is what you're alluding to in your question which is that even cases that fail can establish helpful points of principle, which can be built upon in subsequent cases. I think you've seen that with the, the Sharma case, which I mentioned earlier. Um, they were seeking to propose the, the permit that was granted to a coal mine there. They failed in that, but the minister was being was held to, to owe a duty of care to all Australians under the age of 18 to not cause them injury or, or harm. So it's an incredibly powerful precedent which can now be used for subsequent cases. And I think there's there's also a, a different dimension of these cases, which is that some of them are disinterested really in, in the, the remedy at all. They're about delay. Um, they're about holding up consents because that's obviously important for financiers, people who are looking at funding these projects if they are being seen to be exposed to litigation risks and make some more risky propositions as investments. So again, you know, there are different views as to the appropriateness of, of using the courts in that way, but that's certainly a, a strategy. And so a, a failed case which achieves some delay can be regarded as a win by, by particular um, campaigning groups as well. Well, Harj, that's been an absolutely fantastic run through. Um, those four main points that uh, we've had a little look at there. And it's helped to put a lot of colour on a case like Vorlich, which, as the court said, is pretty dry in some respects. Um, but it helps us to understand what the case is about from different perspectives. So thank you very much indeed. You're packing for Glasgow, I imagine. I need to let you get back to it. Yes, I am. I need to find... A hat, I think. So <laughs> <laughs> warm enough. It's it's pretty far from Sydney, so um, uh, we'll see how we go. But yeah, can't can't wait to get up there. And, and a pleasure to speak to you as as always, Richard. Thanks so much for having me. That's fantastic. Thank you very much indeed, Harj. That was the planning podcast from Number Five Chambers. It's an edition which has some resonance with what's happening in Glasgow just at the moment. Harj, during the course of 
uh, his explanations referred to a case called Sharma. It's an Australian case. But if you're interested to know what the impact might be, what a court might say in the course of a case concerned with climate litigation, it's worth reading and pondering what Mr Justice Bromberg had to say in that case, which is kind of what Glasgow is all about. It was this. It is difficult to characterise in a single phrase the devastation that the plausible evidence presented in these proceedings forecasts for the children. As Australian adults know, their country, Australia, will be lost and the world as we know it gone as well. The physical environment will be harsher, far more extreme and devastatingly brutal when angry. As for the human experience, quality of life, opportunities to partake in nature's treasures, the capacity to grow and prosper, all will be greatly diminished. Lives will be cut short. Trauma will be far more common and good health harder to hold and maintain. None of this will be the fault of nature itself. It will largely be inflicted by the inaction of this generation of adults in what might fairly be described as the greatest intergenerational injustice ever inflicted by one generation of humans upon the next. Of course, I don't invite you either to agree or disagree with that, but it is a stark illustration of what climate litigation can produce in some of the most important judgments. A truly moving and impactful statement. So, to Glasgow, let's see what they can do. We look forward to hearing and speaking to more experts in the coming weeks, finding out what happened and what the impact will be. Until then, goodbye.